For the 2.3 thousand people who saw my previous monologue about how we're possibly stood in the doorway of a post-industrial era, this video is what that video was originally supposed to be. Except, not really. As per my usual M.O. of not recognizing the full depth of a rabbit hole until I'm already up to my hairline in it, the younger, more naive version of myself, who thought he could summarize the entire tech tree of a hypothetical post-industrial civilization in one ten-minute-long chunk, has been replaced with a newer, marginally wiser version, who's concluded that this topic will likely need to be another multi-part series in order to do it full justice. If you watched the last video outlining my personal hypothesis and model for a post-industrial world, chances are you noticed my starting to address the issue of post-industrial technology at one point around two-thirds through, and then sharply veer off that course, never to retake upon it. That's because, about halfway through the first draft, I realized that the concept's premise wasn't nearly as self-evidently derivative as I'd initially thought and lacking a better way to integrate a worthwhile explanation without effectively bifurcating the script's narrative flow, I decided to instead save it for its own time, so I could give it both the proper attention that I think it warrants and the proper analysis that you all expect from me by this point. Now, just in case that's not made it abundantly clear, I strongly recommend that you go watch that other video before continuing with this one, or else its premise will make about as much sense as an out-of-context bear walking around in a red shirt carrying a honeypot. And now, with that understanding made mutual, let us get into resuscitation of the original heart of this matter. That being to ask and answer the question, just how much technological advancement could a mostly migratory, clan-based society retain without ready access to modern industries and supply networks, starting from the point at which all efforts must, be they industrial or otherwise, that being energy generation, and working outward from there. Now, what you probably wouldn't have guessed solely by the title, but which long-term viewers of mine won't be at all surprised to discover is that this Mental River's genesis was a sci-fi story premise I'd dreamt up some years ago about an advanced human space warship crashing onto a feudal alien planet and the crew having to fend off an invasion by their extraplanetary adversaries using only what war gear they, with their advanced future ingenuity, and the locals with their late medieval industry could cobble together. This concept itself having evolved out of the simple yet dense question of, given all the benefits of modern understanding, but restricted by the limits of medieval industry, logistics, and resources, what level of technology could we achieve and maintain? But why, you might reasonably wonder if you've watched my other slate of videos on why modernity is, and was always destined to fail, should modern standards be a benchmark? Well, as I've discussed in the other video I presume you've watched, the two key advantages of adopting a modern industrial model are economies of scale and a wider error margin, the consequence of both being the manpower to design, develop, manufacture, and deploy advanced technological war systems such as tanks, planes, attack helicopters, automatic weapons, and so forth, all of which require armies of dedicated specialists and laborers, not to mention precision machining capabilities that were completely foreign to their predecessors' toolkits, thus their subsequently outcompeting and eventually superseding them in the great selective arms race that is history. This is not hard to understand, or even predict. We're all familiar with the expression two heads are better than one. It doesn't take some esoteric theoretician to extrapolate the implications of that simple truism out by a factor of a million. Now it's worth noting that, by energy, I'm referring to both fuel and food, since what is food if not fuel for animals? as I'm sure I don't need to tell the plurality of those who've made it this far without their eyes glazing over. Generators don't generate energy. They convert one form of energy into another. And in that same way, all forms of energy production are, when we get right down to it, ultimately a discussion on the production of heat, of which calories are a unit, and of which both watts and newtons are direct translations. For efficiency's sake, I've grouped all forms of generators into one of four categories according to their energy input source. Kinetic, differential, which rely on the motion and or expansion of fluids. Constructive, utilize reactive conjoining of two or more elements or components. And destructive, which use divisive chemical or nuclear reactions. It's worth noting that most generators use some combination of the above. IC engines, for example, turn reactionary chemical conversions to rapidly propel fluids to drive a piston to spin an axle. For those who aren't keeping track, that's a five-fold conversion per single stroke. Now, 
I could spend the next 20 minutes rattling off the technical specs of each and every variant on the above available on the market, comparing their pros and cons to decide which method would best serve us in a social energy vacuum environment, aka a post-apocalypse. But I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to further lump these four groups into two broader camps, consumable and renewable. The pros and cons of each, I'm sure, are already well known to you since we've been hearing about them ad nauseum since the 1980s. But future-proofing and power-to-weight ratios don't mean jack or all shit if you don't have the means to actually produce and maintain the requisite systems. Without getting too overtly political, this is the hard, simple reason why fossil fuels are so hard to find suitable replacements for. In a word, the energy density of even the poorest petrol chemicals eclipses nearly all other sources currently known to man, save for only nuclear and, believe it or not, body fat. Thus, though most people tend to think of roads and cars and home electricity when they think about green energy, and those things are certainly valid considerations, there's also the issue of industrial equipment, absolutely none of which works on current iterations of electric power sources. And this is to say nothing of the actual manufacturing processes. Before you can think about gas mileage, you have to first build the engine, and for that, you'd have to find and extract the requisite materials from the ground. Basically, if you want to move lots of stuff really fast, you're going to need a lot of surplus energy. Which means you either need lots of people, which in turn means a massive reservoir of calories and nutrients, or a really big, really heavy, and thus really fuel-hungry machine. Now, could we devise hybrid mechanisms of production by cleverly synergizing medieval devices with a modern understanding of physics and chemistry? Sure. But in the interest of full transparency, if I had any earthly idea how to even start doing that, I wouldn't be making a YouTube video about it. I'd be out on my own private mobile island barge winning all the Nobel Prizes while showing Elon Musk the size of my... Look at my horse! I have a whole wolf pack living inside me and half of them are retarded. But anyway, the less said about that, the better. And like I said before, this is a much more involved subject than a single video's lifespan can encompass. And as my expertise, if you can call it that, on most facets of it, pretty much starts and stops with... Nano machine, son. I think I'll leave it to people better versed in such realms than myself to hash out the details down in the comments section, and then maybe I'll follow up with more detailed expansions on the other areas of interest if there's sufficient demand for them. If that sounds like a good idea to you, or even if not, you know how and where to make those opinions known. And while you're there, if you click that join button, you'll be getting access to all future content up to a week in advance of the rest of the pack, as well as a few other perks. And of course, don't forget to like and subscribe, check out my books and all that other stuff as well. And until next time, stay safe, stay sane, and remember, you can never think too much, you can only think badly. Peace.